Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, my name is Trey Grace. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're really glad to have all of you here. We don't think it's too early uh, <laughs> to talk about the next presidential race. I mean, besides, everybody else is talking about it. And, but I want to give credit to my daughter, Kate, who's sitting here in the middle. Kate is 10. And a couple months ago, Kate said to me that she was interested in hearing a discussion about who might run for president. And so she thought, Dad, you should organize one of those forum things. And uh, so she was the inspiration for this. And we've got an all-star panel uh, today uh, of folks who I will introduce very briefly. And then we're just going to dive in and uh, talk about the potential candidates and assess their likelihood to run and their uh, likelihood of success. Uh, so to my immediate left, I guess that's about right. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> no? I'm to your left. Well, maybe. I'm not sure. I don't know. We'll have to talk about that. <laughs> so Anna Navarro. You know, you, you do teach at Harvard. Well, it's true. Okay. It's true. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Anna Navarro is an IOP fellow this semester uh, and is a commentator and contributor to CNN, um, meet the, um, on, on Sunday morning shows. She was a strategist for um, John McCain's 2008 campaign and as well as John Huntsman 2012 campaign. And as a commercial, Thursdays at 4 o'clock, she has a study group with the best title, Old White Straight Male Voters Ain't What They Used To Be. Well, we've got, well, we've got that guy who's running away from the room right now. <laughs> Say hello, Antonio. So we got the, yeah. Uh, and doing the study group. So the former mayor of Los Angeles uh, will be with us on Thursday. So that's Anna's study group. It's open to the public. To her left, which is appropriate, um, <laughs> Paul Begala. Uh, Paul's a Democratic strategist who's been a scene and contributor and, and host for many, many years. He and his former political business partner, James Carville, were the top strategists for Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign uh, and Wallace Wilkinson for Kentucky Governor's 1987 <laughs> campaign uh, and also worked in the Clinton administration. Um, and one thing I do want to add, since we're in the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, he helped uh, John Kennedy start George Magazine, uh, where he served as a contributing editor and wrote a column, Capital Hillbilly. <laughs> so we're really glad to have a friend of John in the, his forum. Uh, to Paul's left, Karen Fenning. Karen is a political and communication strategist. She currently hosts a show on MSNBC entitled Disrupt with Karen Fenning. Uh, don't disrupt too much tonight. I'll try. I'll okay. try to be good, I promise. Um, and she previously served as the DNC's Director of Communications, the Press Secretary for Hillary Clinton's successful 2000 uh, Senate campaign, and in several other positions throughout the Clinton administration and in other campaigns. And finally, um, I guess so far <laughs> left that we're now back to the right, um, Robert Costa. Bob is the Washington editor for the National Review and is right now one of the hottest reporters in Washington. In fact, the Washington Post's Karen Tumulty tweeted out last week in the wake of the government shutdown and negotiations over the debt ceiling, quote, the only clear winner from this whole episode has been at Robert Costa, N-R-O. Amen. So uh, Bob's been in the early primary states covering the Republican candidates who are laying the groundwork for their campaigns. Uh, so welcome to the panel, welcome again to the audience, and let's get started. So we've got some uh, video visual aids here uh, hopefully we'll turn on uh, uh, behind us. Let's see. Are they going to turn on? Well, so for hill, up, the ball, okay, we'll go back. Okay, there's our title. Okay, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Maybe she might run for president. <laughs> uh, what, do you all, what do you all think? I mean, is there, a, is there a chance that she doesn't run? Maybe that's the way to start it. Paul, oh, yeah. you... you and what is the, you know, what, what, what kind of likelihood is that? And I, I, I couldn't put a number on it, but I, I can promise you, I'm sure Karen can, that, that she has not made up her mind. Hillary, first, if I can digress, John would be so thrilled that you all are here, John Kennedy Jr. He loved the human, and he would, he would actually be defending doing this four years early. And I, I'll get a lot of static at CNN for doing this because it'd be <laughs> premature. But what he loved best, I think, and what he would love now is the human stories. I think he would have been appalled by the government shutdown and the dysfunction of our system the last few days, but would love these human stories that are cropping up, uh, and irrespective of ideology. And this would be one of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did know Hillary, and uh, she is the most disciplined person I have ever met. And I'm telling you, it's like the old commercials when I was a kid. Is it soup yet? It's not soup yet. She's not going to decide until it's time to decide. And right now, she's all about setting up her, uh, her work in the foundation with her daughter and her husband, writing a book, traveling around, giving some speeches, recharging her batteries, and then she'll decide. So I, I can't tell you. Now, 
Should she run? I think it would be a good thing. I have begged her. I've worn out my knees <laughs> begging her to run. I'm not cute about it. Um, so I, I obviously think she should. Yeah. Uh, I would love her to. The problem is, in the post-World War II era, a party has only won the White House three times in a row once, Reagan to Bush. And you, know, you may agree or disagree with Ronald Reagan's ideology, but he was a giant. And he barely won his successor, George Bush mm -hmm. Sr. He won pretty solidly. I shouldn't be, uh, but, but it was, th but that's the only time. It was time. in doubt. I mean, after the convention, he was Dukakis 17 points down the at, the, yeah. at the convention. The governor of this commonwealth uh, was unable to, to pull it off. But that's the only time it's happened in the post-war era. This is not a country that likes keeping one party in the White House three times in a row. I think the Democrats' best shot by far, maybe our only shot, is if Hillary decides yeah. to run. Karen, you worked with her in the Senate campaign. Um, you worked in the administration. How would um, I remember? Open ninety two also doing whatever Paul told me yes. to do. <laughs> yeah. Campaign, so so um, <laughs> if we'd had this discussion in two thousand five, two thousand six, two thousand seven, we would have all begun with the presumption that she would be the Democratic right. nominee and a and a favorite to be the president. But she didn't win. What kind of um, how does how how will this be a different election? What does she have to do to be successful as she was in the Senate race? Um, you know, the, I always around. thought that it was a mistake for a woman who had been a change agent her whole life in, in a year that was about change to run as the, to be the establishment, the sort of, the, you know, foregone conclusion. I thought that was a huge mistake. And one of the things that she did very well um, in the campaign, in her first Senate campaign, she worked her ass off. And at, by that I mean she knew every issue, she, uh, like upstate New York, downstate New York, she spent hours on rope lines talking to people because it was important to her to show that she was willing to do the work. And so I think when you come into a campaign with this element of presumption, people want to see, well, are you willing to do the work? And I think it's not that she wasn't willing to do the work, but you're battling that the whole time. And I do think if she runs this time, she's still going to have that to deal with, right? Uh, this sort of you know, presumption. Um, and I think she'll have to work around that by just, again, doing the work. But I'm with Paul. I don't, I mean, personally, I want her to do whatever she wants to do because I feel like she's earned it. Um, but I agree with, you know, President Clinton said something a while back that I thought was interesting. And he said, you know, you get to a point in your life where you got more days ahead, you know, behind you than ahead of you, and you got to really think about how you want to yeah. spend your time. What do you want to do with this time? Right. And so, you know, when I think about it, I, I agree with Paul. Like, I think, I really don't think she knows, but I also think that if she decides to run, the seeds are there and ready uh, if she does do it. You know, when we talk about Hillary, um, the historical aspect, is so big. Mm -hmm. The fact that she could very well be the first woman president. If she runs, she could be become the first woman president, which is, frankly, I think the historical pool for anybody is huge. That being said, even if she doesn't run, to me, she goes down in history as the first woman who could have been president for real. I mean, is, does anybody doubt that uh, Hillary Clinton can be the nominee and can win the presidency if she runs, that it is within the realm of possibilities. Yeah. That's the first time that that happens with a woman in America. So I think she's made history even if she doesn't run. And, and you know, I'll just add, that's not insignificant actually because we know that so much of vote, uh, the elections for women is getting the electorate comfortable with voting for a woman, with the idea of a woman. So I think Anna's point is very important. But th there's a culture in my party that is exact opposite of the way Karen talks about Hillary running the last time. I think the reason she lost is that she ran as establishment in a party that loves an insurgent. You know, the Democrats usually, can't say always, but almost always nominate the outsider insurgent. And we don't like the establishment in my party, right? It's every Democrat's dream to get on an airplane and hear the pilot say, gee, I've never done this before. <laughs> right? We hate experience in the Democratic Party. We want a surgeon who said, what is this knife for? You know, obviously I'm not that way. I think it's crazy. I actually believe in experience. But we Democrats as a culture don't. We want the new, the fresh. And, and one of your students told me earlier that Maxine Isaacs pointed this out. He's brilliant. She's right. Very difficult for any party, but especially the Democrats, to go from younger to older, mm -hmm. to go back. You know, I mean, Barack Obama, he's got the Grecian formula in reverse, but he's still only a 52-year-old man. And Hillary will be, I think, 68, 69 yeah. when she's running. It, it, it can happen, but it's, she's running against the culture and traditions of her own party. She could overcome it with the historical nature of her candidacy. 
I think, because she's a woman. She's going to, I think, have to run a very different campaign than she ran before. Of course, you know, we are in this environment now where the parties have had this identity switch because all of a sudden, you know, (laughs) we used to love establishment. Right. Just when I got into the establishment, now it's not no longer. (laughs) I hear you, Anna. Exactly right. So, Bob, you've been out on the trail. Um, What have you been hearing about? I mean, obviously, you've been covering more the Republican candidates, but I'm sure they're talking about who they might run against. Oh, they're very much talking about Secretary Clinton. It's interesting when you when you ask operatives and activists about Secretary Clinton, how they see her ahead of 2016, you first hear a lot of noise. You hear the same 90s uh, analysis of of Hillary Clinton, that she's this far left uh, wife of Bill Clinton, and then you of course now hear Benghazi, and that she had this supposedly failed tenure as Secretary of State. But when you talk to top level operatives, they're not talking about the 90s image of Clinton and that caricature, and they're not talking about Benghazi, but they really come back to uh, the, your point is that there's a gen- the Republicans sense there is an opportunity to beat Clinton if she runs because of the generational divide, and that they can cast the Democratic Party, who maybe is so swept up in the moment and the meaning of Hillary Clinton's candidacy, that they don't recognize her vulnerabilities, especially if the Republicans have someone like a Governor Christie from New Jersey, a charismatic blue state Republican who could maybe sneak in in places where Hillary won big if you remember in the 08 primaries, in places like the Philadelphia suburbs, uh, where, where, where she had a, a constituency that would cause a lot of Republicans trouble. Republicans think it's going to be very hard to beat her if she runs. They assume she's going to be, she's the presumptive Democratic nominee if she runs. But they don't think she's unbeatable. And I think that's interesting. You don't really hear that when you talk to conservatives now who they're cheering on Ted Cruz and they're yelling Benghazi when they ever hear Clinton. <coughs> but the, the closer we get, the more you'll hear about uh, this, this uh, image of Clinton, this political uh, facade will start to crumble a tad because there are some pl- spots there where she can uh, you can go at her. So let's go to uh, Vice President Biden. Maybe we begin with this. Is there a scenario where she where he runs against Secretary Clinton that is a realistic scenario? I don't think so. Do you, there anybody here think that? I think he wants it, right? I mean, I, I, I know he wants to run, but I don't think he challenges her. Well, they, they all want it. Right. I mean, I, it's, yeah, it's, but Joe it's, wants it really No, bad. but like <laughs> running for president is like having sex. You don't do it once and then stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's run twice, and he's going to keep running until he gets it, but maybe not this time. Yeah. I, I do think it's unlikely. So let's start from the presumption that if she does not run, then Vice President Biden and some of the other folks we, we talk about right. uh, now have a field. So if she does not run, does Bi- how big of a favorite is Vice President Biden? Or is he even, a, can, would he be a favorite? If you come back to my presumption that it's a really tough race to win. Now, the Republicans may give it to us, and they're giving every sign now that they're just going to forfeit the race, which would be fine with me. <laughs> but you can't have a strategy based on your opponent self-destructing. So we'll get to them in a minute. But for my party, he is the only one pa- post Hillary, sans Hillary, because what, what Hillary can do, and I think what Biden could do, is stitch together this remarkable coalition that President Obama has put together, remarkable, of the rising American electorate, of, of single women, of Latinos, of African Americans, uh, and young people. And he can, I think he can really appeal to them. I, I know Hillary can, and I believe that Vice President Biden can. But then add to that a little better than Obama with white working people, which is, I mean, everybody calls him Joe. He's the, he's the vice president of the United States, and he's still just Joe, Joe, the son of a car salesman from <laughs> yeah. Scranton. I mean, he has that appeal. Hillary does, too. That's what I'm looking for in my party. Can you hold that remarkable Obama coalition together, and then, because I'm greedy, also add a little to it of the of the white working class folks? And well, I think also, only he, Hillary and Joe but, can but do But, that. Paul, he does have some problems in that, you know, whereas Hillary Clinton is seen as substance and serious, uh, Vice President Joe Biden has developed somewhat of a caricature of, mm-hmm. you know, being gaff prone and the crazy Uncle Joe. Uh, so, you know, he's going to have to overcome that. I don't see anybody that's working as hard right now to put together a coalition. I can tell you that every time there's three Democrat Hispanics in the room, Joe Biden shows up. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like right. the Holy Spirit. Wherever <laughs> there are three Hispanics, the man shows up everywhere. Um, and, and he's doing the same thing in Iowa. He's got no qualms about going to a steak fry. He's got no qualms about showing up in South Carolina for a fish fry. Anything you fry, the man is there. <laughs> so uh, I think he's uh, very actively working at it. And I, you know, and I asked him once, because I know him and like him, and asked him, well, Joe, you know, what about the age thing? The age was a factor for, for McCain. He got asked about them. Boy, did he get defensive. So, uh, and he's in great shape. So let's, um, next up, two of the locals from here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Governor Deval Patrick. Um, there's been some chatter about Elizabeth Warren, her ascension, the, the growth 
uh, that she's shown when she first got in office is parallel to um, Senator Obama. Mm -hmm. And Governor Patrick is viewed as somebody who essentially was Governor Obama, President Obama before Obama. You know, his, the 2006 campaign was the prequel, if you will, to 2008. What about the, the likelihood, Deval Governor Patrick has said he's not gonna run. Um, Elizabeth Warren, I think, has probably said the same thing, but what about their likelihood of running, again, under the presumption that Hillary does not run? I, I see them as potential VP candidates more than I would say running for president. Like if you're Joe and you go and you try to get Elizabeth Warren on your ticket with you or Deval Patrick with you, that helps balance out some of the other issues you're talking about. I covered Elizabeth, Senator Warren on Capitol Hill, and she does not have a presence on Capitol Hill. I mean, when you hear people talk about Senator Obama, he was someone who was engaging with reporters, he was cultivating a national profile. Perhaps Senator Warren is doing that on the left, but you don't see it, she's not out there in the way like a Senator Cruz is trying to shape the national conversation. No, no Right. No, no one's out there. <laughs> so let's, you know. But I think Warren's more of a favorite of the left rather than a front runner to be kind of a challenger in the Iowa caucuses or something like that. Okay. Uh, then we sort of have a catch. These are names you hear people who might want to be president, um, especially again. So you've got Martin O'Malley, who's the governor of Maryland, uh, who's term limited. Uh, Andrew Cuomo is the governor of New York running for re-election next year. Senator Amy Klobuchar, who's the, and I think was just re-elected re in Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, uh, also just re-elected er, in New York. Howard Dean, who had run previously and was the DNC chair, uh, and was your boss, I think. He was my boss. And Brian Schweitzer, <laughs> who actually did make some news this week about uh, expressing his interest in running. What about these six uh, uh, chances, likelihood of success, that sort of thing? Anybody want to weigh in on any of them? Someone, obviously, first off, they're not going to give it away. Right, right. And they're not going to give it away to Hillary. I'm all for her. And in my life, I've never seen the kind of uh, support early for anyone. I, this wasn't around for Reagan. This wasn't around for, certainly for Bill Clinton, for even for, certainly not even for Barack Obama. Right. So I've never seen a more favorable terrain than there is for Hillary. And yet, because it's a Democratic Party, someone will, and he or she will do well as being the anti-Hillary or the anti-Joe, the anti-establishment from the left, giving voice to the kinds of things, especially that Senator Warren uh, speaks out about. There is a powerful, somebody's gonna stand up in my party. And Would it be good for her to have somebody? Good for Hillary? I, I like, you know, as far as like, you know, getting her, helping her find her voice yes. and testing her. And I like tough, mean, rough primaries. I like them. Because, I mean, look, I hope, I wish everybody would be unopposed, but then we'd be in North Korea. Mm -hmm. You know, I want, to, it, it helped Barack Obama, that death march with Hillary. It was the best thing happened in the Democratic Party. Right. We registered Democrats all across the country. Nevada alone became a Democratic state because of the Hillary-Barack death march. And it hurt John McCain right. not yeah. to have it and to be sitting there for three months. And nobody cared while, about him. Uh, yeah. right, while, right, while this was happening on yeah. the, right. and I also think, look, one, I think one of the deficiencies that, that Hillary has, that she's a formidable candidate, but let's face it, the woman hasn't done politics in a long, long time. The most unpolitical post there is in the U.S. cabinet is Secretary Yeah, you're of not State. even, by, you may not know this in the audience, but you're not even allowed to do politics. It's not, it's not that it's not custom, illegal. it's you're not allowed, it's so illegal. So she's been uh, trekking all over the world in a big, huge United States of America jet talking lofty issues with international leaders, which is enormously different than going, you know, schlepping around Iowa talking about ethanol subsidies and eating rubber chicken. So it's, you know, she's, she's rusty. And she I, ran, uh, she didn't run, run the best of campaigns in 2008. And I think politically, she would benefit from having a Karen primary. Karen wants to disrupt one, you. Yeah, but <laughs> one of the things about Hillary Clinton, in addition to being very disciplined, she knows exactly who her people were in Iowa. She is still in contact with them. I have no doubt in my mind. So I would, don't think she's rusty. She maybe hasn't been out on the campaign trail, but I don't think that she's been disconnected from what's going on. I, I just so how do you how do you uh, you know she, she's got such wherewithal about it, and she knows who her people are. Why was her campaign in two thousand eight, Mark Penn, Solis Doyle? Why was it so dysfunctional? Yeah, that I can't answer for you. Right. <laughs> yeah, she, it was she terrible. Won, everybody said she wanted to run for president in the worst way, and so she did. <laughs> um, it, it was a terrible, awful campaign. And that's like the first primary. If she hires Mark Penn, then we'll know she's going to lose again. I'm, I'm serious. And, and she won't, I don't believe. I, yeah. I tell you what, Hillary's mama never had to whip her twice for the same mistake. 
you know, this is not a dumb woman. And I think, I think her campaign ill-served her the last time around, to put it mildly. Uh, and I doubt very seriously that she will make that same mistake again. I mean, she's just a, like, one of the smartest people on the planet. Is she's there, not going to do the same thing. Is there anyone else that we ought to put on our radar screen, the question mark photo, as we're thinking about potential people to be, you know, to try to be the spoiler, or try to, you know, want to sell books, or get your name ID up, or some <laughs> of the other reasons why you now run for president uh, that um, are out there. I mean, John, Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado was one we threw out in the green room. Is there anybody else that we ought to just, that you can think of at this point that uh, might disrupt? <laughs> Dennis Kucinich have another one in him? You know, you look for governors, not senators. Even yeah. though in Washington we always look at senators, and every senator looks in the mirror and sees the presidential seal. The truth is this country elects vice presidents, governors, and Civil War generals, mostly from the Union side. Um, and so we got to look at governors. Well, right now, you know, Jerry Brown is the governor of the largest state in America. He's not going to run for president. Right. Okay, we already talked about Andrew. You know, he's the governor of the third largest state. In the, it, you know, yeah. it, and we did Massachusetts, and a lot of the other big states right. are governed the, by the Democrats. The governor of Florida's right Republican governor of Illinois is going to have a very difficult re-election. He may win, yeah. but he's not going to run for yeah. president. Where's so, the foreign policy voice? I, I think that there's room for a, when Howard Dean sided with the administration yep. in Syria and other issues. I thought he was almost taking himself out of being perhaps a dean again. There's room for an anti-war. Like a Russ Feingold kind right. of well, type. I don't know if Feingold. Feingold. I don't know if Feingold's going to re-enter the arena, but. Uh, if you have a Biden-Hillary race in the Democratic primary, where is the anti-war Democrat there? Where is the, the anti-war and anti-Wall Street. Right. That's what's going to come. Occupied. Someone yeah. will step into that, someone we're, we may not even be mentioning, and she or he will do very well. Uh, I, I don't think they win, but my party likes an insurgent. Someone's going to stand up yeah. and say, no more drones, no more NSA spying, no more flying around the world with SEAL Team 6 and, and killing people. And by the way, no more Wall Street. I, there's a sense that some on the left have that if you go to Wall Street, they tell you Barack Obama's a Marxist. If you go to some people right. on the left, they tell you he's a sellout, so whatever. But yeah. I, I do think you're right, Bob. Okay. I just don't know who that is. But the message is there. The opening is there. I just don't think it's the majority in my party. I, yeah. I think this is one of the great accomplishments, first of President Clinton and now of President Obama, is they have really modernized and moderated the Democrats, where we are much more happy in the center than we used to be when I was a kid. Well, we'll look for that as the place to maybe find uh, find somebody. Um, let's, but let's move on. we got a bunch of Republicans. All the Republicans want to run for president. Um, let's start with Chris Christie. Obviously, he's got to get reelected in a couple weeks. We'll assume that happens. Uh, otherwise, we'll have him as an IOP fellow. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Chris Christie. Um, Bob, what, do you, you know, what are the folks out there? I was just with Governor Christie in New Jersey. He's lost a ton of weight. He's eating mm -hmm. well. He's sign. in great yeah. spirits. He's bounding towards a big reelection victory in New Jersey. And the thing about Christie is, Conservatives are unhappy with him because he supposedly hugged the president during the storm. But when you look at his record, it's very conservative. He went after the unions. He's a pro-life governor in a blue state. So you're, uh, in he does not have a Romney care on his back in terms of policy. There's nothing that's policy-wise that he's going to carry as a weight. So I think, look, he may have to uh, let Cruz win Iowa, maybe let someone like Rand Paul or Cruz win South Carolina. But if you go, if you ever seen Cr Governor Christie do a town hall, he has McCain's talent. And he could go in New Hampshire, I think, and win New Hampshire, do well in Florida. Uh, and so I think you've you got to consider him. And the one thing, I, I, the establishment loves him. The Romney donors love this guy, regardless of what he did during the storm. And that's going to be important. That's still an important block within the party, as much as Cruz gets all the attention. And I think his, you know, his re-election in, uh, in, in November, in a couple of weeks, I don't think you get him as an IOP fellow, at least not in the short mm -hmm. term. And it's going to be very significant because we're going to be talking about the coalition that Chris Christie managed to build in New Jersey. He's going to get very strong numbers from Hispanics. Mm -hmm. He's going to get strong numbers from women. He's going to get strong numbers from independents. He's going to get strong numbers from all the people that Republicans need in order to broaden the base and win a national election. And I think that's going to be his more, most persuasive card. But I think the biggest challenge for the Republican Party in the primary, all of the you know sort of mishegas we've seen playing itself out in the last couple of weeks, is all going to be front and center in 2016 in terms of the party deciding what direction you're going to go. Because as we've talked about before, getting through the Republican primaries in some of these places means that certain people who would otherwise make a great national candidate never get there. And so I think the party is going to have to decide between the Tea Party faction and the sort of establishment faction and all the factions in between, do you really want this thing? Because if you do, you may have to, you know, put some issues behind you in order to get there. A lot of th another thing that I think benefits him is that he's a Washington outsider. 
and he has no qualms about loudly telling you what he thinks about Washington. All of the Tea Party leaders uh, that might run for president, you know, at least the, the ones that come to mind, uh, are from Washington. This goes back and to what Paul was saying about governors right. being good candidates. And the, dis the dysfunction in Washington has got uh, everybody disgusted. Is he probably the most formidable, knowing what we know today, candidate for the Democrats to, to take on if he were the Republican nominee? No. Based upon what we know? You don't think Jeb Bush is more formidable uh, than Jeb him? Bush is more formidable than yeah. him. Yes, you're right. It, 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 but outside of Jeb Bush, would uh, he Jeb be? Pretty, look, he's the thing that I we'll always, talk about Bush in a second. always look for, and of course Mitt Romney had this, is a you know a, a red guy running winning a blue state. You know, I yeah. like President Clinton. Arkansas was a swing state back then, but it was yeah. very very conservative Republicans uh, in his state. He worked with them. You want that. The problem is to get nominated. Romney had to disavow everything, mm -hmm. right? Everything, and Christie. He's, he is being sort of sneaky and careful, but you know, New Jersey is a very pro-choice state. It's a very pro-gun control state. He's gonna have to disavow everything. He's gonna have to pretend he doesn't believe in evolution or gravity or photosynthesis or electromagnetism. <laughs> he's gonna have Maybe to- Maybe not all those. He's like the old Lewis Black joke. He's gonna have to say that, that, that the Flintstones was a documentary, that man lived with dinosaurs. <laughs> he has no idea how crazy the base of his party is. But you see, I don't think he's going to have to do that. And the reason he's not going to have to do that is because if you've got seven other guys doing that, Maybe. there's a space, there's a path and a space for somebody that doesn't do that. But that's and, and there was for Romney, too, but maybe he's got he, he um, has a, political talent. a little more spine. He's a former U.S. attorney. I, when you speak to Chris Christie, he has a confidence that on a debate stage, he can beat you. And so I think he's not scared by Cruz. He can beat not you. Not scared by up. the base. Right. And, and, and but Romney I think was. to but, Anna's yeah. point, what he, it would be all about the path, right? It would be being about his campaign would have to be very strategic about the path because unless he was willing to do as Paul said, there are plenty of states he's not going to win, and that strategy wouldn't work to get him where he wants to be. He can't do what Paul is, is saying because he knows he can't do it. I mean, what, what Chris Christie brings to the table is Chris Christie. The fact that he's so genuine, that he is the anti-Romney and his authenticity and his emotion and his, you know, just being bigger than life, larger than life, louder than life. So he, he just can't do that. If he does that, there goes Chris Christie. So let's talk about... Uh, Rand Paul. <laughs> Why don't you talk about Rand Paul? <laughs> I'm moderating today. <laughs> we in, in Kentucky, it would be great to have a Kentuckian as a president. Go ahead, chime in. You have strong opinions on Rand Paul. <laughs> well, I think Rand Paul has come across as a winner in this, one of the few winners uh, of this along government with Bob, shutdown, right? along with Bob, because um, <laughs> you know he really effectively figured out how to straddle the middle. And he was the guy talking about things like compromise and getting away with talking about that on the Republican side and still having the support of the base. So I think he won some brownie points with the traditional Republicans and some donors. He also seems like he is, in terms of wanting it, that he wants it. Like he has clearly started to change his behavior, change his language. We're not talking about drones and people at grocery stores or liquor stores, right? I mean, on Syria, he was very serious. Um, in this last battle, he was he had the perfect you know sort of position staked out, but it definitely shows you that he is conscientiously trying to build a persona and a place for him. And then again, that may be part of how he thinks about his path through a Republican. And he's primary. been doing some non-traditional or non-traditional for a Republican outreach. outreach. He's, right. You know, he's been going to Howard University and discussing African American issues, he's gone to the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and yes, yeah, so, you know, those things sound elementary, but uh, they're not. Well, and he's a big the, proponent I was at for that sentencing US, reform. And I was at that speech for the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. He was great that day. When, when you, I was looking through the New York Times archives at one time, and uh, there's an article from 1988 about Randall Paul advising Ron Paul's 1988 presidential campaign, and there's a tendency to look at Rand Paul and think he's just a right-wing kook and his father, there's these libertarian outsiders, but the Paul family has been playing politics for two plus decades, and, and, and Rand Paul knows how to play politics. He may have just ran his first race in 2010, but he knows it. He has a, sh a smart, strategic staff around him. He's already wooing all the Romney donors. He's trying to cast himself in this new light. I was just out with him at the Reagan Library. He's talking about composting. He, he, he loves almost sounding like a hippie in terms of he fit in in Cambridge here. Uh, <laughs> talking to, in, in organic food and farming and sustainability. But it sounds real when he does it because he, he, that's who he is. 
And so I'm not so sure he has a straight shot to the nomination, but he's going to be a compelling figure because in Iowa, evangelicals like him. He has a different approach to, to pastors than Cruz does, a little, little of a softer take, but still popular among them. And in New Hampshire, they like his whole attitude, and they like his father. Remember, his father did well in New Hampshire last time around. So uh, definitely, but the, the, the key thing now is can Grand Paul separate himself from Cruz? Because there's really a competition now between Cruz and Paul for that right flank. It seems like Paul, not so much as moderating, but temperamentally is moving away from Cruz, maybe trying to get his own little space within the primary uh, discussion. Well, and I think some of Senator Paul's space, if it exists beyond him, we'll see, is the anti-war right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is serious exactly about right. this. Uh, some people see it as neo-isolationism. I tend to, but others see, see it as a healthy sort of, of you know, McGovern used to talk about come home America. He'll run that line in a party you know, that gave us Bush and Cheney and McCain and a, a very aggressive internationalist, interventionist foreign policy. I, he will run and the, straight against that. And the party's moved in his direction on that issue. I mean, the, there are more Republicans who are receptive to that than would have been in 2008, you know, when his dad Absolutely. first ran. They're nervous the about it. Look what, during his filibuster, they all kept coming to the Senate floor. They didn't want to miss that opportunity mm -hmm. to be seen with Paul because there's a real donor base there as well. Uh, so we put these two up on the same screen. Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, Jeb Bush, former governor from Florida. The reason why we put them together, not just because of Florida, there's a kind of a presumption you wouldn't see both of them run, which maybe we can discuss that. But uh, what about these two candidates? You uh, know them both well. <laughs> and I think well, it would be listen, great to I'm hear, to put you in this awkward spot. <laughs> I, hope they, uh, I, hope, I hope one, one of, them of them runs. Won. I hope both of them don't. Uh, you, but you buy the fact that both of them will very likely not run. You know, only one of them would, would actually pull the trigger. You know, I, I in politics, um, a lot of times, you know, people get cynical, and it's easy to think that relationships are not real, but the friendship and respect and mutual admiration between Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, I think, is real. Uh, Marco Rubio um, was Jeb Bush's mentee when uh, Jeb was uh, governor, and, and I just have a very hard time seeing them run against each other. They would eat from each other's donor base. They would eat from each other's uh, structure. Um, you know, it would make my life a living hell. Um, <laughs> so I, I just don't see that happening. I think Jeb Bush is in a very, very similar situation as Hillary Clinton. Uh, he also is very disciplined. He has said as recently as three days ago on, uh, to Jonathan Carl on this week that he is open to this and that he's seriously thinking about it, but that he hasn't begun to think about it. He's got a set of criteria he's going to use as to, you know, should he or should he not do it? He's not going to start thinking about it until, um, After the until next year. I think the Bush brand is certainly improving. Um, you know, his brother, People often say, well, you know, we can't elect another Bush for president. Well, okay, but listen, for the last six years, every time you see or hear about his brother, he's either helping a kid with malaria in Africa or he's helping a wounded warrior. Uh, or painting. He, or painting well. or doing something <laughs> like that. He's, he avoids politics like the plague. Um, all you do- And his approval ratings are up. His approval ratings are up. I think, um, you know, the frailty uh, of health of George Bush Sr has also brought a wave of goodwill, and we keep seeing George Bush Sr., despite his frailty and his advanced age, do things like shave his head in solidarity with a child going and through chemotherapy. start the trend of the socks, the fun socks. But, mm. it, so I, I think mm. the Bush brand can be better. I think he's got the same issue I think Hillary has, which is that they haven't done politics in a long time, and uh, he is um, rusty, but he's got, like Hillary, brand name ID, they can wait till the but very end. Bob, what are you the hearing Bush, out on the- The Bush brand unites both the Democrats and the Republicans. Democrats hate Bush and the Republicans hate Bush. Other than that, it's a great name. <laughs> um, and uh, no, he should, ch if he, it's unfair. He is their most talented candidate. He did run a huge state really successfully. Um, you know, he's bilingual. You know, he's, his children are Latino. I mean, he's like the, like the perfect creation, except, you know, maybe he can change his name to something more appealing, like Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, I just disagree. And I think B President Bush Sr. is to be admired. I think he's a, 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 a really, a real class act. I, I, I think uh, his, his older brother, 
it's the biggest disaster we've ever had in, in the White House, certainly in the last century. And there's no chance. I'm sorry, it's unfair to Jeb, who's a really gifted guy. I think the but contrast with his brother, because their personalities are so different, because their uh, interests their are so different, different. Let's be honest, Jeb is because really, really smart. Because their ability in Spanish is so different, <laughs> is going to be, uh, is going to, could actually end up uh, the helping Jeb. The problem Jeb. that Jeb would have, I think, is he will, there, the obsession with, you know, did you agree with your brother on this? Would you have done this way? Would you have done it that way? I mean, I've, you know the media. I mean, there's an obsession with that kind of stuff, and I think part of his challenge would then be, you know, maybe he should run as just Jeb, right? Like, just to try to get away from the name, because I think it's going to be hard for people to see him through that veneer. And a similar challenge that Hillary Clinton faced to be just Hillary, not. And that's why in 2000, the Senate race, just it was just Hillary. Hillary. Yes. Bob, it, what do you? But please? her husband's got like a 70 percent, 65 percent right. approval rate, okay. and it's in the Democratic Party even higher. Right. So it's not the same. I mean, but what's the what kind of um, out on the stump, and what are you? You know, what are you hearing out on the, some of these early states about Bush? Because he hasn't gone out and really done some of these political events. He's been visible, but not, not doing Very lukewarm. The I was just in New Hampshire speaking with some activists and operatives. I mean, you think about it, Governor Bush has not been on a ballot since 2002. And so if you're uh, in your 20s or 30s, he barely is on your political radar. I, whenever I speak to Jeb Bush's former advisors, I get him way off record. I'm talking truly candid. He's not doing anything. He's playing ahead. He's not talking to people. He's not thinking about donors. He's truly focused on his educational foundation. And the Republican Party right now is not interested in an education policy wonk. In fact, this, this common core stuff that Governor Bush worked on, it, it's becoming uh, really unpopular with the right. And so he's not in a position, he's not, and the other thing, whenever I speak to Governor Bush, whenever I see him at events, I don't see the hunger to run there. And I, I just don't see it, and, I, I, and it, I'm, it's reinforced whenever I talk to his advisors. And there's not a, the, the clamor is among the donor class, the elite donor class. But when I'm on the, people don't mention him in Iowa. They don't talk about him in New Hampshire or South Carolina. So, so let's talk about Rubio quickly. Um, we've been talking a lot about Bush. So if, let's assume that again, Bush doesn't run, Rubio does run. Um, the last year hasn't been that great, I think, for Rubio's political near-term future. And that's the thing. That Rubio sort of seems to be nowhere right now, right? I mean, immigration was going to be his thing, and then that didn't quite work out. And in the way that, you know, Rand Paul kind of figured out a strategy, and I think clearly has figured out, this is, the, you know, this is the selection of the Tea Party people that I think I can get and keep, and I can still kind of move a little bit to not crazy land. Uh, Marco, just, it just feels like he doesn't have a strategy, that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have a vision of like, this is going to be my pathway. Ted Cruz, on the other hand, you know, his pathway is all over, but at least it feels like he's got a strategy. You know, I, I'll say this about uh, Marco. Of all the Republicans we've mentioned, I would tell you that Marco, by far, has got the best oratory skills. Uh, he is incredibly articulate, uh, dynamic, uh, also uh, totally bilingual, um, and, and just has a way of reaching an audience that really nobody else that, that's in that field has. Um, he, this has not been probably you know, the best year, he has not, he's not uh, as hot as he was at the beginning of the year. But we've had, but you know, everybody's been hot for about 15 minutes <laughs> so far this year. Marco was hot for 15 minutes. Rand Paul was hot for 15 minutes. Ted Cruz is hot now. So this, this hot for the moment thing is, I think, highly overrated. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think he's, he's got to prove his staying power. And somehow, he might be able to maneuver into, you know, Thread his way through the The argument for Rubio is that he's a, he can appeal to Tea Party and establishment in the way that a lot of these other candidates cannot. Is that, a, is that Bob, do you think that that's kind of a... I think that's right. He's got to find a way to thread the needle on immigration. How does he sell that to the base? Whenever I think of Senator Rubio, I was just reading a, a lot of Kennedy stuff, and you look at how John F. Kennedy in 1956 tried to speak at the convention, maybe be Stevenson's running mate. I think in some ways it's a little early for Rubio. He's, his pers political persona, is, it's emerging and developing. Uh, and he, he hasn't, he, he seems almost skittish now about where he fits on the right spectrum. Is he, is he Cruz? Sometimes he appears with Cruz on the Senate floor. Other times he, he, he avoids those kind of moments. And he just doesn't have a comfort level with his politics that's settled and that's going to drive him forward. But I, I, we need to move on to a couple more so we can get to questions. I apologize. Harry's standing right there. So speaking <laughs> of Cruz, uh, and who's the flavor of the month right now, um, is there any possible? I don't need that flavor. Is there? <laughs> so Ted Cruz right now is, is is dominating congressional politics, dominating sort of the policy debate right now. Um, I feel 
like as a tax and polishing answer that one. Run, Ted, run. I'll pay your filing <laughs> fee. <laughs> Amen. I want him almost as bad as I want Hillary. Oh, my God, I love Ted Cruz. <laughs> love, 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 love Ted Cruz. This is what my friends say. You know, I grew up in Sugar Land, Texas, which was Tom DeLay's district and is not a liberal bastion. And I go home, and I see all my old redneck friends I grew up with, and they think this is great. It's like, what do you think about the government being shut down for 19 days? It's a good start. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. He is what his party wants. He is what the base wants. He is not a renegade. He's not just out there. He's a renegade from the establishment. But I'm telling you, this is what Republican primary voters want. It's not what I want. It's what I want as a Democrat. But you know what? He, I'm, th you hear this a lot. I bet you Bob hears this all the time. They say this. Well, Romney was a squish. And McCain was a squish. And even Bush Sr., maybe not Jr., was, he was kind of a squish. We always nominate the squishes. By God, and we always lose anyway. By, why not just get one of our own? Sure. If we're going to lose this, just, and I'm totally for it. It's a Thelma and Louise strategy. You know, boys, just hit that accelerator as you reach the cliff. And that's what they say. And I think they have to get it out of their system. I think they need a 40-state loss. I think they, yeah. it, my party needed it. 1984 redux. 1972. 1972. Where, 1964. where, you know, my party ran Senator McGovern, who was a great man and a war hero, but he was way out of the mainstream of America in 1972. And we went right off a cliff. He carried one more state than my grandmother that year. <laughs> now, Cruz won't be one, but he'll be 10 max. You have Utah and Mississippi and a few other, you know. Yeah, but states. listen, you talk about what the party wants, and uh, there is not one Republican party right now. And, you know, we do know that Rand Paul is going to win. Out of all of these, you know, the one that I think has staked the ground out the most definitively is Rand Paul. They eat from each other's vote. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think... Um, Ted Cruz is making a lot of friends in the base and certainly has got a, a, a big level of support there. But he's also making a lot of enemies uh, you know, on the way because, um, because he has no problem uh, going after other Republicans, something that Rand Paul is not doing, something that Marco Rubio is not doing. He's not teaming up with some of these organizations and raising funds to defeat Republican incumbents. If those incumbents get reelected, like it or not, they're going to have some power and some ability um, to uh, come back and buy it. Why don't you weigh in here and then we'll Real move quick on, on Senator Cruz. I asked one of Cruz's friends the other day, what is the strategy here for 2016 with the shutdown in CR? He says, don't you get it? That because we all agree on policy and principle, McConnell is the same as Cruz when it comes to actual beliefs. You have to make strategy and tactics the battlefront. And Cruz is heading into 2016 now where he's going to out conservative anyone on tactics. And so if you disagree with his approach, suddenly you're a rhino. And that's going to set him up for the primary as the conservative, regardless of if he's taking a bold policy position. It's all tactics now. That's the Civil War. That's where Cruz thinks he can win. That's his space. Okay, so these are four folks we, who were on the ballot in 2012 at some point. Rick Santorum and Rick Perry both ran for president. Uh, Paul Ryan was Mitt Romney's running mate. And Scott Brown was on the Senate what ran for, was a senator and was on the Senate ballot here. Um, any of the, Perry seems to be wanting to run. Um, the other three, maybe not so clear. Uh, Brown, I think, is having fun. Um, do any of these four, do you think any of these four will be a factor in the 2016 race? No. Ryan. Ryan, you think, is probably. I, I think, don't think so. I don't, you think he runs? I, I think the misconception about Ryan is that he wants to be Speaker of the House. But this is a guy who walks around Congress every single day with ear pods, listening to, to heavy metal music. He's not someone who wants to operationally be Speaker of the House. I think he enjoyed being the vice presidential nominee. I've interviewed him about this. I think he, he's, he's going to be writing a big book. His, remember, he came up as Jack Kemp's assistant. He, he thinks of himself as the next Kemp, as the generation's Kemp. And so I think he wants to be in that conversation rather than just being a House player. I am a huge Paul Ryan fan. Uh, like him tremendously. I don't think he performed that well, uh, you know, as, as the vice presidential candidate. A lot of it, frankly, was because the Romney campaign wouldn't let him be Paul Ryan, uh, because it would it would reveal a lot of schisms between him and and Romney on things like Hispanic policy, like immigration policy, et cetera. But you know, budget chair. I mean, he's in his in his huddle. And he's able to make such a difference where he is. And I think he's very much enjoying the role he has now of behind the scenes crafting of big compromises. 
So let's uh, go to the last group. We call this side the Midwesterners. So John Thune, Senator from South Dakota, Mike Pence, former congressman, now governor of Indiana, Sam, Sam Brownback, former senator from Kansas, now governor, uh, Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, John Kasich, former congressman, now governor of Ohio. Uh, anybody, Scott Walker probably is the name that stands out the most from this group. Uh, any thoughts on, on this group? Again, I, you always prefer a governor to a senator, just to make an odds. And those four of those five are, are governors that from the Midwest are actually passing and accomplishing conservative ideas. Uh, they're all in different ways impressive. I think the, the sleeper, Bill Costa said this in an email earlier, but I, I knew him a bit in DC, is Pence, yeah. who is as every bit as conservative, but not at all crazy. He's real smart, and mo all those guys are, but he's, he's really pleasant and unthreatening. Don't, don't forget. Ronald Reagan never sneered. Ronald Reagan never used sarcasm. If you read a Reagan speech and read a Sarah Palin speech, these are two completely different animals. Okay, Reagan was sunny, optimistic, pleasant. Everybody liked him. And uh, Pence especially has that gift. All, actually, all those guys do, but Pence especially. Um, and then is there anybody else who we want to throw out there before we invite the audience to come in? Herman Cain. Herman Cain. <laughs> Please, God, if only. I mean, because there's no presumptive, there's no Hillary Clinton on the right, there's no presumptive nominee, there's no party leader, you're going to see everyone who even thinks they have a little bit of a shot to get 10% in Iowa is going to run. And, and Governor Palin, I'm sure, is going to take a serious look at yeah. it. Yeah. Herman Cain, uh, people who ran before. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, he, we, Nash Review talked to him the other day, and he was again floating himself up He's there. He's going to throw his hair in the <laughs> ring, you think? Yeah, throw his hair. <laughs> Hopefully just the hair, we'll see. Okay. But, well, uh, yeah. Well, good. Well, like I, we talked a little too long, but we couldn't help ourselves. Let's bring the audience in. Um, I could ask some summing up questions, but I'll, set, I'll let you guys do this. So we have four microphones, two on the floor, uh, two in the boxes. Uh, as always, the rules here in the forum, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, a question uh, contains a question and ends in a question mark and does not contain a speech in the middle. So why don't we start right here? Hi, thanks so much for being here. I'm Caroline from South Carolina. Don't know what affiliation you want. I'm Democrat. Um, no, like the Harvard affiliation. Oh, right? Harvard, sorry. I'm a first year MPA, dual degree at the Kennedy School with Sloan M at MIT. Um, curious, um, you mentioned Sarah Palin on the right as a woman who would possibly run. Where are the rest of the women? Um, I feel like, especially if Secretary Clinton runs, is there going to be another possible contender that could um, also make that historic move? You know, I don't think we have, we don't have, we certainly don't have, um, we've got, Many very good women. I don't think Sarah Palin's going to uh, seriously look at running. She's, you know, just re-signed with Fox. She's going to tease about it. She's going to toy with it. She's going to talk about it. She's going to sell another book. But I don't think she's going to run. We have, we have, um, we have, you know, a number of women who are probably qualified to be on the ticket. They don't have the breadth of experience and brand name that somebody like Hillary does. But I would not be surprised if you end up, if we end up with a Susana Martinez as a vice presidential candidate or a Kelly Ayotte as a, a vice presidential candidate. So I think there's women out there who you may very well see on the ticket. I made up the PowerPoints, by the way. And just in that, we thought about the, those women, and we decided for exactly the reason Anna said that they seem more vice presidential material right now, not necessarily in the future. Would everybody kind of agree on that? Mm -hmm. But now, maybe you'll ask this question. If Hillary's the nominee for the Democrats, do, do you almost have to pick a woman running mate if you're a Republican? Uh, or does that get viewed as sort of pandering and backfire? I mean, and does that raise the, you know, the likelihood of an Ayotte or Martinez candidacy? Uh, I, I, I think if you do it for politics, it smells like politics. And that's what happened to poor Senator McCain, uh, a man whose whole life has been about country first. And then just in that instant, he looked political. And it, 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 that's the only, seriously, having been through this with Bill Clinton, and I wanted him to pick Harris Wofford, the most important qualification, he was a client of mine. Right. <laughs> Another Clinton, big win. Harris, Harris was a, a North Beat East an school. IOP director, by the way. Exactly. Dick Thornburg. He, he, but he, <laughs> you know, Clinton was a Southern conservative Democrat, Baptist, young. Harris was older, Catholic, yeah. Northeastern Senator. It was a perfect match. And Clinton was in love with Gore from their first meeting. And I said, Gore didn't even endorse you. He said, if I pick him, I believe he will. I said, yeah, OK. <laughs> you got me there, sir. <laughs> and then I said, what does he bring? He's just like you. He's your age. He's your region. He's your religion. He's your ideology. He said, I might die. And I thought, holy crap, we're in a different game here. 
And I, I, don't, I don't even like Dick Cheney, but I think when Bush picked him, it was not for his charisma or Wyoming's three electoral votes. I think George W. Bush rightly said, he could be God forbid I die, who should, who should run the country? Okay? And I think whoever the Republicans or the Democrats nominate, they have to start with that. And voters can sniff it out. I think people believe that Palin was a political choice, and that's why she was a disaster. Right here in the second. Hi, my name is Carolyn. I'm a junior here at the college, and I'm asking this question on behalf of the forum committee. What do any of these candidates need to do to significantly change the electoral landscape? Are there certain issues or demographics that they really need to be focusing on to build strong coalitions in the next four years, or maybe even create new battleground states? I, mean, I think the sure, challenge of the Republican Party is that they are doing everything they can to run away from what is the emerging electorate in terms of younger voters, African Americans, Latinos. I think they have not found a way to make a case to those communities, <coughs> and in fact, I think they've done themselves a lot of damage, and that is the rising electorate. I mean, so unless they can go out and find more old white men somewhere, I don't think they're, that's, I think, going to be the big challenge. And that's part of why, though, I, I think that the Tea Party base for the Republicans is so important, because there's that, I think, within the, the Republican Party, there's that re reality that you have to have those voters. You can't not have some part, portion of those voters and think you're going to get enough of everything else because I don't think they're going to get those other well, I think I think there's two schools of thought in the Republican Party right now on this and on everything, basically. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's one school of thought that thinks, well, we lost in 2012 because we didn't get enough of our base out. Right. If our base had just shown up to, <laughs> vo to vote, we would have won. Then there's another uh, school of thought to which I belong, which, you know, thinks that we need to broaden the base. We need to bring in those other groups. Um, again, you know, you, you're describing one general Republican Party. You are going to see the numbers that Chris Christie posts with some of these non-traditional groups who are Republican, and it's going to be impressive. It's the reason you're seeing Rand Paul show up at Howard University and at Hispanic events. It's that, you know, now, the policy matters. And again, it's why I think Chris Christie has an advantage or anybody from outside of Washington has an advantage to try not to be tainted with some of the rhetoric that's going on in Washington that's just not helpful to attract uh, some of these other groups. Thank you. Up in the back there. Hi, my name is Madeline Lear. I'm a freshman at the college, and I'm gonna be asking the official Twitter question of the night which is, it has been theorized that in 2012, the unprecedented amount of Republican primary debates forced many of the candidates to move to the right, whether they wanted to or not. Or not. Do you agree, and do you believe this problem will occur in the future? I, I don't think it's gonna occur in the future. You already see the Republican National Committee, Chairman Priebus, is working to shorten the amount of debates. Uh, which you know he has no control over, right? Right. Okay. But candidates were fed. I mean, <laughs> That's the biggest load of bull. Na Nash Review <laughs> sat down with uh, Governor Romney after the election, and there is, he, uh, we sat down with Rick Santorum, Gingrich, even Gingrich, who, who loves the debates more than anyone. It was too much. And so I think you're going to see a little, a little more party discipline. But it's going to be hard, though, because it's going to be such a large field. Exactly. That, and, and the TV networks make so much money off these things. And the state parties make money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the thing is, if you're a network and you get three or four, and then you're, if, even if you're someone who's running ahead, you're not going to not go. You're not going to not show up. And I can tell you, having been through this, all due respect to Reince Priebus, he has nothing to do with it. It is all about the campaigns because the campaigns will tell you, see ya, it's free coverage, we're going on MSNBC, we're going on CNN, we're gonna go do this debate. And it's not the debates. Yeah. It's the candidates and what they say. Nobody hold it, held a gun to Mitt Romney's head <laughs> and made him say really offensive things about immigrants. Okay, and, and the fact that they had those debates does not mean that you have to associate with the lunatics. They had so many opportunities. There was a debate in which Wolf Blitzer asked uh, uh, Ron Paul, I believe it was, about health care and said, what if a young man has no health insurance, gets in a motorcycle accident, and shows up dying at the emergency room? Somebody in the crowd said, let him die. Yep. Well, the only decent thing to do is say, no, sir. We Republicans do not believe in letting people die on the streets, right? Smack him down. They didn't do it. They all, right. they all wussied out. The, the, there was a, a service member, who's a gay or lesbian, I can't remember, uh, who, yeah. who, who asked a question by satellite. And the audience booed this young man. I think it was a man. It was a man. And yeah. th th again, if you're on the stage, I know what Bill Clinton would have done. I know what Ronald Reagan would have done. I know what Barack Obama would have done or Hillary. They would have smacked that audience down right then and there. And these things were a gift to the Republican candidates. They were just too cowardly to use it. Or maybe they actually believe that stuff. I don't know. 
But I, I, I'm not for blaming I the base. These guys need to strap on a pair and go out there and, and, and actually take on their, their <laughs> lunatic base. And I, I, and I think, but I think, I th look, the batch of, of candidates we're uh, talking about right now is significantly different than uh, 2012. 2012 You mean was, different, better? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're better. They're better. Yeah. They're more articulate. Uh, they're better prepared. They're more dynamic. They're more, you know, you've got a Chris Christie who says anything that, you know, that crosses his uh, mind and hasn't shown any, uh, any reservation on continuing to, to do that. So I, I just think, I just think you're going, and, and we have the lesson learned of 2012. But Karen is right, you know, controlling the debate um, calendar is something we all would like, but in t the theory is a lot easier than the execution. But didn't you guys try to do, when you were at the DNC, didn't you all try to exercise a little bit of discipline? Actually, you know, what ended up happening was and, and exactly what I was saying. Because some of the other candidates who were farther behind kept wanting to do all the debates, it was actually Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama's campaign that came to us and said, please, can you sanction debate so that we can try to find a way to call down the number. We did, we sanctioned six debates, but that didn't stop, what was it, 27 in total. I mean, they still, yeah. again, you know, if an organization is gonna do it and there's gonna be media coverage and you know that right. half the field's gonna be there, you can't not be there. One of the reasons 27? I don't want Hillary to run is because, you know, if she doesn't, then you guys end up with 10 candidates and, and 20 debates right. and I'm going to enjoy it so much from the other side. <laughs> No, but those 27 debates didn't hurt Barack Obama. No. They made him they smarter got better. and tougher and better. And it should have done that to the Republicans. It probably will. You're right. I mean, I, you can't. My party, as I said earlier, cannot sit and rely on the other party's self-destruction for its strategy. Republicans too often do become obsessed with this media question, that the media is biased and the media is controlling these debates and they're killing the party. But uh, the debates are debates. They're, we've been having them for the, our entire political history, and it's, it's really the, the content of the debates that matters more than who's hosting them. Well, and you know, and Romney sort of stood up in general, stood out above the crowd in the debates. One of the reasons why I got the nomination, he looked more presidential. Well, and he had money, speaking. Chris. He, you well, know, no, no, he, no. Had, he had staying power. He so did. He did. But there were several times where he, you know, his his rate, his, right. his candidacy was on the line, and he won debates when it was when he needed. But them. you know, that's why. Establishment and donors still matter because if this thing goes long, you need uh, their money. on either side, you need that that influx of money. Jacob, uh, hi, my name is Jacob Morello. I'm a junior at the <coughs> college studying economics, and uh, my question is: To what extent do you think that social issues are going to play a role in the 2016 election, especially on the Republican side? Of course, um, you know the the issues of gay marriage and abortion were, um, you know, tough issues for the for the GOP to handle. And you know, with the exception of, I can only think of maybe Chris Christie that you know is kind of known for taking um, you know a stance that maybe is more in line with the average American. Um, how do you think that these issues are going to come up? And you know, will candidates have to change their views from what they you know said before, or are they going to be able to stick to their you know their um, current positions? I mean, when you look at just what Governor Christie did this week, the Republic not one Republican on that list is pro-choice or pro-same-sex marriage. But there is a temperament question about mm -hmm. can Christie still be tr for marriage as is, traditional marriage or heterosexual marriage, and be pro-life, uh, but can he appeal to people who have different views on that? Mm -hmm. And can he broaden the tent? Uh, but you're not gonna see a nominee because of the, the way the party is right now that is gonna break. Uh, a Rob Portman, I don't think he's gonna run for president mm -hmm. and, and even try to run on an issue like that. Maybe It's just not gonna happen, but the question is, how are they going to appeal to people who don't share those views? And can someone you know, Bob, get beyond? I, I think the way to do it is, frankly, the way Catholic Democrats do it when it comes to the life issue. Every Catholic Democrat that has run tells you that he is personally uh, against abortion, but it's not going to you know, influence other people and is going to respect the law, is going to respect the court's decision. I think there's a way for, uh, for Republicans to skin this cat. And also, on the gay rights issue, the gay marriage, it is the most rapidly changing social issue of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, God knows how far this needle's gonna have moved in two years. We're at 14 states now. Uh, if, we're, you know, if we're at 20 some states in, in uh, 2016 or so, it becomes less of an issue because it is a fact. Well, but the, the base is moving the social issue agenda to the right, not the middle. 
It's extraordinary. This happened for the first time in 2012. There was a, the, there was a consensus among the Republican presidential candidates that the federal government should not fund contraception. Not abortion, which has never been funded because of the Hyde Amendment. Contraception. Now, Title X of the Public Health Services Act was written by Congressman George Bush of Houston in the 70s. It was signed into law by President Richard Nixon. It was a Republican idea, and then it had bipartisan consensus for 40 years. Nobody said, oh, gee, it's a terrible idea to provide family planning services for poor women. Everybody in both parties agreed. All of a sudden in 2012, all of them, Mitt Romney, the Commonwealth's governor here, came out for zero. He said, I want to defund Planned Parenthood. What he really meant was the Title X federal funding. I mean, he would not outlaw their private fundraising. But that's a really extreme position. I'm a faithful Catholic. 98% of Catholics practice birth control and 2% lie. <laughs> um, this country ain't going there, but the party is. And when you see that kind of really radical divergence between where the country is, settled consensus on a social issue, and then where the party is moving harder and harder against, I mean, this is not, th this is radical, it's not conservative. But there's also a demographic issue because the tone, and this is where tone and craziness comes into play, because mm -hmm. it was the tone of the conversation that right. so offended women, oh, right, that oh, you'll, you'll, I mean, exactly. And this idea that, you know, you think I'm too stupid to know what medicines I can take. I mean, that's literally the tone of the conversation. And then, like, before you even got to the abortion question, it was so offensive. And I think the Republicans completely missed that. And I think, you know, this growing electorate of, you know, single women with some money of their own, wanting, you know, caring about these issues, caring about economic issues, saying, I can't vote for somebody like that. I agree with you that the tone was a problem. I also think the problem was, but it wasn't necessarily the tone from uh, the the serious candidates, but from uh, you know things that were happening on the outside, right. and the candidates, the serious like candidates, didn't didn't stand up strongly enough right. mm -hmm. against some of that. And I think that's a lesson that's been learned because I've seen in recent months that when Steve King says something terribly offensive, all of a sudden you see Republican leadership in the House, in the Senate, from the RNC, from different sectors come out mm -hmm. and. I don't well, totally you know, agree with that. I think well, he's I think it's a lot crazy that they just let go. It's significantly better uh, and, and more dramatic than it was four years ago. Let me, uh, we've got time only, unfortunately, for the folks in the upper level. Two more questions. So we're going to have this question and this question, and then we're going to have to cut off. So we'll start here. Hi, I'm David. I'm an um, undergrad at Boston University studying business administration. I had a quick, maybe simple, maybe not simple question. You guys were arguing before about, um, like, Bush's name and if it's good or bad, and and same with Clinton and same with Paul. I was wondering if a candidate would have a last name, which, what, which one would be the most positive one? Kennedy. Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. Probably Clinton, right? Is that? The Republican Party, Reagan. Yeah, yeah. Reagan. Zuckerberg wouldn't ha hurt. <laughs> 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 yeah, $2 billion payout today. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right, Kennedy. OK, great. So it was simple. Good, last question. Um, my name is Sonia, and um, I live down the street. And I was wondering, in talking about broadening the base and the social issues and the women thing in 2012, could that possibly mean an evolution of the two-party system? And if so, I know that's a wildly fantastical idea, but um, what would it take to do that, and how long do you think it would take to do that? By which you mean the third or fourth party forming out of? Yeah, like how it's so bipartisan now and just like the prefix by two parties, like it's always Democrat versus Republican, especially in the last few weeks. That's all we've been hearing. And with all these social issues coming up and, you know, the single women electorate, could we see a change in I that the challenge over of time? Republican primaries in this. It, the, is, it's always, it's a logistical technical question because I mean part of what the party infrastructure essentially gives you is you know infrastructure within the state um, a base of voters databases donors and so to sort of if you're going to be a third party you have to recreate that from the ground up everywhere and I think that just the logistics of that and the money in that I think is that to me like even when Bloomberg was talking about it I thought that was a little unrealistic because it takes time but also I like having two huge relatively diverse, stupid, lumbering parties. And I work all around the world now. I do lots of campaigns all around the world. 
And I really like that here because I do think usually, it has not worked the last few weeks, but usually it gives us a stability. And so when one party goes too far one way, then the other party occupies the center and then the other, you know, then the first party corrects. And it, so far it has worked pretty well. Sometimes you have a third party movement like we did with Ross Perot in the early 90s. But you know, they say they, it's like a bee, they sting and they die. And the Democrats adapted. I, I don't believe we would have been as, as committed or successful at balancing the budget had it not been for Perot. So even though he was crazy, he, he made a real contribution. He made the Democrats more fiscally responsible um, to, in order to get those votes. That's how I think political science um, really ought to work. The question is, would the Republic, but also good training to be the president. If you can hold together, Reagan used to say, sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the far right hand is doing. <laughs> but he held together the country club and the grassroots in a remarkable way. I think the Democratic Party is even more diverse, much more diverse. And you just saw Barack Obama, Harry Reid, Nancy Pelosi hold together Bernie Sanders, a socialist, and Joe Manchin, who's so conservative, he shot a bullet through the, the carbon uh, bill, through the environmental law. So that's good training to be president then, if you can hold together these two very diverse parties. And as but, Republicans, we have to learn how to live with diversity of thought, how to live right. with each other. Uh, because, look, we're, we're a minority party right now, if we split up, we're going to be two smaller minority parties. That's just not a way. Making the party smaller, uh, you know, in, a, a, applying a purity test and having, you know, telling everybody who doesn't qualify that they should leave the party, that's just not the way to win a national election. Um, maybe if I could ask the last question, I don't know if anybody wants to venture this. I, don't say Hillary's going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party. That's too easy. Let's <laughs> venture a guess to close. Who's going to be the Republican nominee? based upon what you know today and do you think it'll play out? Can you say? If Jeb Bush does not run, Chris Christie. You know, I, Yogi Bear said predictions are always difficult, especially about the future. It's just, it's not my party and it's not my year. It's just so far away, I can't imagine. Yeah. Although, honestly, if I had to guess, Ted Cruz. <laughs> you watch. You know, I, I, Ted I Cruz. suspected Ted Cruz was a Texas plant. <laughs> <laughs> I <call the> <laughs> After tonight, I'm pretty you know. convinced that this, this, this is the case. Karen, what do you think? I would say either Christy um, or Paul, Rand Paul. I think it's going to be the longest Republican primary in years, and it's going to be Christy versus Cruz maybe at the convention. Wow. Well, that'll, be, that'll give us a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, thanks to all of you for coming. Please join me in thanking our panel for their insight.